Hey everyone, we're Nick and Rachel. If you're new to this channel, then typically you would be finding us chronicling our adventures around the world. But today's video is going to be a little bit different. The reason that we're creating this series of videos is because there are a number of different things that we have noticed in each of the countries that we visited that are very different to what we're used to in the UK and Canada. The reason that we have this channel is to share our travel experiences in the hopes of inspiring others to travel more themselves. With that, we want to share some of the tips and tricks that we've picked up along the way in each of the countries that we visited, so that if you want to go to the same places, you'll have some helpful information and knowledge that will help with planning and also navigating around a little bit easier. Today's video is going to be focused on travel around Sri Lanka. <laughs> If you've been watching our videos, you'll know that we went to Dambulla, Sigiriya, Kandy, Nuara Elia, Hapitale, Ella, Udawalawe, and finally Marissa. Because we spent a lot of time in this amazing country, then we are going to come at you with quite a lot of pointers today. While a lot of these are going to be specific to the places that we've been, We'll also throw in a few general ones, just so that you know what to expect about the country as a whole. We hope that you find these useful. Before you even get to the country of Sri Lanka, you need to apply for a visa waiver, which is very similar to an ETA or an ESTA. You can apply for it online. It costs about $10 US per person, and you need to present it at immigration alongside the landing card. Another thing to note is you may have to print it, so just check what the regulations are at the time you're traveling. For a lot of our travels, then we used eSIMs, and specifically the Aerolo app, in order to make sure that our telecoms was all taken care of and that we were connected during our entire time going around the world. However, we did find that there were certain countries where actually picking up a SIM card at the airport was a lot cheaper than even getting an eSIM. And Sri Lanka was one of those places. They ended up getting very, very affordable packages with huge amounts of data, but what they also threw in was free social media. And by that, that means free access to Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, YouTube, and a bunch of other things, which is unlike pretty much most other places that we had been to at that point. So, if you are looking to get connected while you are in Sri Lanka and you don't already have an existing package that is going to take care of that for you, then it's definitely worth considering getting a Sri Lankan SIM card for the duration of your visit there. However, just bear in mind that you will need to provide your passport so that you can be officially registered with the telecoms company if you are planning on getting this at the airport. When you fly into Sri Lanka's main airport, it is known as the Colombo Airport, that is their capital. However, the airport is actually located closer to a city called Nagumbo. And the best way to get to either Colombo or Nagumbo is by Uber. It is by far and away the cheapest option. However, Uber can be a little bit tricky because sometimes it's too busy or the driver will message you and tell you that there's too much traffic so it is a little bit challenging to actually get a pickup from the airport although it is possible the only other option unfortunately is to take a prepaid taxi and those cost an arm and a leg it is probably three to five times more expensive than an uber would be so i would say uber should be your first port of call try it out if it's not working though prepaid taxi it is as mentioned, Uber is available in the big cities. However, from our experience, we did not find it to be the most cost-effective option by any stretch of the imagination. Typically, you can get a tuk-tuk, aka a rickshaw, which you can also book through Uber, and that ends up being a lot cheaper than getting a car. Otherwise, public transport is very well connected across the entirety of the country, and by that we are talking both trains and buses. We ended up using buses a heck of a lot. And the reason for this is because you didn't have to book anything in advance. You literally just made sure that you got on and paid for your ticket while you were on the bus. 
and the actual cost of the bus journey each time was no more than about five dollars canadian for the two of us to get anywhere and that's irrespective of how long the journey was so in terms of value for money you really cannot argue with taking buses while trains are definitely available in order to make sure that you have a more comfortable experience on these and you may not just be standing up then Bear in mind that you do probably have to book about a month or so in advance to guarantee that you get the type of seat that you want. The buses in Sri Lanka are cheap and frequent and they're kind of like a school bus that has been decorated in colorful graffiti. They are definitely something to behold. They do make frequent stops more so than if you were going to be getting on a train and the seats are not comfortable for lengthy journeys. So if you're someone who is tall, like Nick, you're probably gonna be stiff when you get off. And if you're someone who's prone to travel sickness, this might be an issue. The other thing to keep in mind is that the majority of buses in Sri Lanka are not air conditioned. If you do want a bus that is air conditioned, they do not run as regularly and they also cost more money. As with its neighbor, India, Sri Lanka is almost exclusively cash based. ATMs are common, but also like with India, it can be a bit of a lottery as to which one will work with the cards that you're trying to use. And equally, ATMs may also have run out of money by the time that you get to them. So we would definitely suggest making sure you shop around with different ATMs. And once you've found one that works for you, you just use that one exclusively. Also, it's probably best to try and go sometime between maybe two or three in the afternoon so that you can guarantee that it has the most amount of cash that it's gonna have during the day. Tap water is not potable in Sri Lanka, so you cannot drink it, nor can you use it to brush your teeth. You are going to have to buy bottled water, but like many of the other countries, because this is the case, bottled water is very affordable and you can use it to stay hydrated as well as use it to brush your teeth. If you're planning on getting any kind of food here, then it is worth noting that everything is washed with some form of bottled water. So therefore, for the likes of us with our Western stomachs, then there are far fewer worries about anything upsetting you than perhaps in other countries around the world. If your hotel has the option for breakfast, then you should definitely go for it. It's usually absolutely delicious and the portions are huge, so it provides incredible value. We stayed at a number of guest houses and they would bring out not only toast and sandwiches, fresh fruit, smoothies, eggs, as well as some kind of traditional Sri Lankan food. So it was a feast. And speaking of the food, we loved it. It was absolutely awesome. It's very, very similar to Indian food, but with a couple of twists here and there. So typically speaking, most of the things that you're gonna get are gonna be some kind of curry, which will come with either rice, roti, which is kind of like a coconut based bread, or hoppers, which are kind of almost like a pancake. And there's two kinds of those. So there's your normal hoppers, which again are pancake-like, and then there's string hoppers, which are made from little rice noodles. All of that is absolutely awesome and should not be sat on. In addition to that, we absolutely fell in love with a very spicy dish, which was called coconut sambal, which they have for breakfast. And we just loved that. But another thing that became an absolute staple because it's also very cheap in most restaurants is called kotu roti. So they take roti, they chop it up into bits, and then they put it into a stir fry with that chopped roti being a replacement for rice and it just works an absolute treat with a little bit of added chili sauce there's few things finer anything with fresh fruit will have been incredibly fresh and very ripe from that day so it is a hundred percent worth having because it will probably be some of the freshest and most delicious fruit that you'll ever try one of Sri Lanka's major exports is tea. So they will always offer a pot of the most high quality Ceylon tea with breakfast. So if you're someone who loves drinking tea, this is paradise for you. 
And the other thing is that tea is so cheap in Sri Lanka, especially when compared to coffee. Unlike a few of our previous countries that we visited, and to be fair, we did go through a lot of Muslim countries where drinking is restricted if not prohibited, then booze is definitely available in Sri Lanka, and it's available through liquor stores in particular. However, in terms of the pricing, it is worth noting that beer and spirits are a lot cheaper to get a hold of, so that saving is then passed on to the customer and means that those are the most affordable options for you. If you're more of a wine drinker, just bear in mind you may be paying an additional premium to enjoy it. The thing we loved most about Sri Lanka is that nature and wildlife are absolutely everywhere. Even in the major cities like Kandy, you cannot escape the natural beauty in this country. And the natural beauty is varied. There are so many national parks that you can go to. Go on safari and you can see elephants, crocodiles, monkeys, big cats. Alternatively, if you're by the beach or the coast, there are whales and dolphin tours you can do. There are even turtles that lay their eggs on the beaches. There is just such an abundance of beautiful nature in Sri Lanka. That being said, it's also possible that nature will join you inside your accommodation sometimes. Don't be too worried about this. There's nothing poisonous that's going to kill you. We're not talking like huge spiders or snakes, nothing like that. We had a few little tiny frogs that fit into, you know, the hole underneath your tap in a sink. They found themselves a nice home there. And of course, we had the occasional gecko, but don't worry about it. They're harmless. If you ignore them, they'll ignore you. Another thing that really made our experience in Sri Lanka, aside from everything we've already listed, is the people. They are genuinely some of the nicest locals that we have encountered anywhere. And that's not even to discredit anybody else, because generally speaking, we've had nothing but good experiences up to now. In the case of Sri Lankans, you're always welcome with a smile. And if you have questions, then they will always direct you in exactly the way that you need to go. Even if they're trying to barter, or trying to get you to sell something, if you tell them a polite no a couple of times, they'll direct you to where you actually want to go. And I think the thing that really took us by surprise is that anybody who works with tourists has an ingrained knowledge of the bus systems and where best to go to get to where you want to. It's absolutely amazing and they are so helpful with that. And that was probably one of the most helpful things that we could have relied on because none of that information is available, unfortunately, in Google Maps. Of course, there may be the occasional person who might ask you for a photo or for some money, but by comparison to some other places that we've been, then this is far fewer and further between. Now for some city-specific recommendations. If you are going to Dambulla, then the cave temples are definitely worth a visit. I think that was our highlight from that city. We absolutely loved our time in Sigiriya. And the main reason for that is because of the views that you can get from two gigantic rock formations that give you some of the best views of the surrounding landscape. Those two are called Pitarangla Rock, and the other one is called Lion's Rock or Sigiriya Rock. In terms of the views you get, they are extremely similar, but the difference really is in the pricing. While Pitarangula Rock is a very reasonable price of 1,000 Lang and Rupees, which based on the exchange rate that we had was four Canadian dollars per person. Whereas for Lion's Rock, because of the fact that you're visiting an entire complex with ancient temples and all of that kind of thing, then the price is a lot higher at 30 US dollars per person. So we would generally say if you have the budget, if money is no problem, then definitely do both because it's still pretty great. But in a pinch, if you were being more budget conscious and you could only do one, our suggestion would be doing Pitarangula over Lion's Rock. And our other suggestion would be trying to make sure you can do it for sunrise because there are a few better ways to take that in. And of course, with Pitarangular Rock, with the views that you get, they also take in Lion's Rock anyway. So you get all of that included. Some of the most beautiful scenery is on the train ride from Candy to Ella. That in and of itself 
is a highlight and tourist attraction, the train ride between those two cities. As Nick mentioned, the trains have different classes and the one that has the assigned seating fills up really, really early. So you need to book at least a month and a half. Otherwise you're gonna find yourself jam packed with other people. Second class has seats, but they are not assigned to you. And there are so many people standing around the seats. And third class has seats that are not quite as nice as second class with far more standing room. You do not have to do the Candy to Ella train ride all at once. We actually got off the train and stopped for a day or two at some of the cities between Candy and Ella. So that's also an option if you don't wanna just do the long train ride. We also ended up in different classes each time we hopped on and off the train because first class was not available to us for the entire duration of the ride. So we actually got to experience all of the classes, which is how we know so well about them. Regardless of what class you're in, as I said, the landscape is some of the most stunning you will ever see in the world. So highly recommend doing this train journey. And the great thing is with each of these trains, there is gonna be a section whereby the doors are always open. So if you wanted to have that very freeing experience of hanging out of a train, or you just wanted some absolutely incredible photo taking opportunities, then definitely taking advantage of that is the best way to get it done. It's very Instagram worthy. When we first arrived to Nuara Elia, which incidentally is on the Candy to Ella train line, one of the major things that we were excited about the prospect of doing was the end of the world viewpoint, which is in a national park called Horton Plains. We were very enthusiastic about the prospect of doing this until we started hearing some horror stories from people who had gone. Apparently, the price is very, very high to begin with, but they only accept Lankan rupees. So if you go in there with USD, then they charge a conversion rate, which they never disclose to you. And apparently the currency conversion is definitely not in line with current conversion rates either. And so essentially they kind of make up the pricing as they go along, depending on how much they want to charge people that day. So with that, what sounds like it could be 25 USD could potentially end up being as much as 60 or 75. So if you are a bit more budget conscious, then perhaps that's something to avoid because you may end up getting unexpectedly stung. However, if budget's no problem, then you know have at it, but don't be surprised if you find that you're spending a lot more on entrance to Horton Plains than you first expected. Nuara Elia is one of the most walkable cities that we went to in Sri Lanka. From our guest house, we were able to walk to a waterfall. We were able to walk into the center of town and see a lot of colonial buildings, as well as to a pretty famous lake. The other thing that you may want to do while you're in Nuara Elia, or at least at some point while you're in Sri Lanka, is visit the tea fields because, as we mentioned before, that is one of the greatest exports of Sri Lanka and they're very proud of that. We ended up going to Pedro. Now, when you're looking for the location of this on Google Maps, do not go to Pedro Estate. Make sure that you're going to Pedro Tea Factory. A little bit further along the Ella to Candy train line is Hapatali. And we found the views were absolutely amazing from there. But the major reason that you would go is to go up to Lipton's seat and then walk back through the tea fields as you come back to the town. We wanted to make sure that we got there in time for sunrise, so for that we ended up getting a tuk-tuk to take us up there so that we could enjoy it in time to really appreciate the views. And we would thoroughly recommend that you do the same because it was probably the best sunrise we've ever seen. They do actually have a cafe, which is up at the top of Lipton Sea. And while it is about 100 Lankan rupees for a cup of tea, which really isn't a lot, it's under 50 cents, the food that they serve in comparison is astronomical. So if you are not interested in paying a lot more than you'd expect for food while you're up there, then politely say no and that you just want tea. Ella is a really cool city. I would say it's kind of 
Western and hip in terms of the food that it offers. You'll find like acai bowls and smoothies. However, the two major attractions there are Nine Arches Bridge, and that's the famous bridge where you can walk on the railway tracks and then take pictures as the train comes by. The train times are kind of variable, so just check with your accommodation or host for the most up-to-date train times. And the other really famous attraction there is Little Adam's Peak. We found it to be a moderate hike and the views up at the top are really nice. Next up, we decided to go a little bit out of our way to head to a place called Udawalawe. And this is the site of a national park which is very well known for having a very high concentration of elephants. And so it proved. We ended up turning up and we saw tons of them. But in addition to that, we also saw eagles, crocodiles, deer, buffalo, pretty much everything that you could shake a stick at. It was also kind of interesting because when we were walking to our accommodation, then we saw this massive tree that had nothing but giant fruit bats on it. So that was another collector's item on the wildlife front. So if you are very interested in seeing any of that kind of thing, then definitely give Udawalawe a look. It is one of the cheapest national parks in the country for seeing those kinds of things. In terms of the accommodation, it will definitely look suspiciously cheap, but this is usually because they have a tie-in with a tour operator that takes you to the national park and you can book it directly through them as well. So that would be the main reason for that. Marissa is a little beach town on the south coast of Sri Lanka and it's basically paradise. White sand beaches, blue ocean, sunny weather. I don't know what more you could ask for. Just like Nuara Elia, Marissa is very walkable so you can get to the beach, to restaurants, cafes, bars, viewpoints very very easily. But something to note is that in terms of food prices it is a little bit more expensive than the rest of the country. And I just have to give a quick shout out to our favorite favorite restaurant in the whole of Sri Lanka, although I can't complain about any of the food we had in Sri Lanka because it was all amazing, but Mom's Spices, which I actually think they're changing the name of it so it might not be called Mom's Spices anymore, is the absolute best. They serve fresh, high quality food. They can make it vegan, dairy free, gluten free, and the mom and daughter who run this restaurant are just so kind. So if you want some really delicious and healthy traditional Sri Lankan food, you should go there. And that brings us to the end of our list for Sri Lanka. We had genuinely the best time and Sri Lanka ended up being by far and away one of the best countries that we've been to. So we thoroughly recommend you go to this country and enjoy it as much as we have and for any kind of itinerary that takes you to that part of the world you 100 percent throw it onto the map while obviously we are drawing upon our own experiences we do recognize that the list that we're providing to you is not exhaustive therefore if you have any further questions or if you have any suggestions for things to do or recommendations yourself then feel free to leave a comment below. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.